Academy. Dave Jones has been at the Academy since 1957, uh, serving as an instructor and then becoming uh, chairman of department, director of publicity, the middle school principal, and then rose to the top as the headmaster in 1966. Uh, he has brought the academy from, uh, well, let's see, uh, <clears throat> from very traditional independent school to the really into the, the 20th century, uh, where they're uh, skilled in uh, computers and all kinds of things like that. Uh, I'm going to let Dave tell you about that, uh, but I would like to mention he has uh, become uh, well known in the North Central Association and the Independent School Association of the Central States uh, as an evaluator, and he's uh, well regarded in that area. So, I would like to uh, introduce Dave Jones and have him finish. about the death of uh, Chandler Winkler said he was an alumnus of Martin Park Military Academy and I'm sure he would have been here and he could have corrected me uh, <laughs> as I went along. Chan would not hesitate to do that. <laughs> Let me say first that our uh, commencement, our 124th commencement is on Saturday, June 7th. That's this next Saturday. We have an outdoor uh, commencement as long as it doesn't rain and I certainly would like to uh, be sure that you know that you're all welcome. The public is welcome at all of these uh, commencement exercises. So if you've never witnessed an academy graduation, you might find it interesting uh, to sit out in the sun, if it's not too warm, uh, and, and join us for that uh, very special day. <clears throat> uh, Pat asked me to speak on relatively short notice, and of course most of what I have is already packed away, getting ready to move. Um, and I certainly didn't have a lot of time for any new research. So what I did was to um, go to a history of Morgan Park Academy that I had prepared some years ago, and I reviewed it, uh, added some, and changed some things to make it a little bit more accurate, and I also borrowed rather heavily from a paper that had been written by an Academy alumnus, I think about class of 58, uh, Ed Rund, who had done some graduate studies, and part of his dissertation was research on uh, the Academy's history. I uh, had not seen that paper that he had written for some years, and uh, what was interesting was it was very heavily footnoted, although the copy that I had didn't have any of the footnotes or the documentation. Uh, but I am going to write to Ed uh, this week and see if I can't get a copy of that uh, paper that he prepared, because I think it's something that the Rich Historical Society uh, should have. <clears throat> The history of the Academy, 124 years, is, is a long time. You get even a very brief summary of that in, in a short afternoon uh, uh, time is rather difficult. I'll try to have you out in time for the Bulls game. That doesn't start till 6 o'clock, does it? <laughs> Incidentally, I enjoyed looking at the pictures around here, and I have a few others that uh, I'll get to just as we go along. Uh, that you might be interested in seeing. Some of them are similar to what's posted, some you may never have seen before. Back in 1873, as part of a plan to enhance the cultural attractiveness of the Morgan Park community, the Blue Island Land and Development Company set aside a 12-acre plot at the top of the ridge for a boys' school as an appropriate institution for that type of residential district. The land was deeded free to Captain Edward Kirk Talbot of the New Baptist Union Theological Seminary, which had already constructed Morgan Hall a year earlier on five acres of land. Even earlier than that, in 1872, Dr. Gilbert Thayer had been induced to establish his Chicago Female College to the south near 112th Street. Funds were solicited from residents of the village in order to establish the boys' school. 
and by the fall of 1873, the Mount Vernon Military and Classical Academy opens it, opened its doors to about 10 students in the newly constructed Park Hall and Drill Hall located near 112th Street between Bell and Hoyne Avenues on the site of the present gymnasium. of this building, Park Hall, that um, uh, I'm, Park Hall that are uh, around on the bulletin boards in different places. But this is a little bit different because it shows the cadets in the picture. Just a building, a picture of a plain old building. I'll leave these up here so that you can get a little better look at them afterward. But this was uh, a picture taken in 1887, I believe. And it's very interesting to look at the uh, uniforms, which will look a lot like the Civil War uniforms of the time. Uh, as I said, that building was located on 112th Street on the site of the uh, present gymnasium there. Colonel Samuel Shelton Norton, the largest contributor, was appointed as the first head. One year later, in 1874, the name of the school was changed to Morgan Park Military Academy in honor of Thomas Morgan, an early owner and settler of the land in the area. Surprisingly little is known of those early days. There are several fires that I'll mention briefly probably re, uh, resulted in the loss of a lot of records uh, from that time. Apparently, the school did live up to its obligation, however, to provide for an English classical and military academy for boys. Although legend at the turn of the century was that the academy had been founded on a bluff and continued to operate on the same principle. <laughs> One early written account of the school, which I've never seen, apparently stated the purposes of the school as being to prepare boys for college, to fit cadets for entry to West Point and Annapolis, and to prepare them for practical business life. An early brochure showed an enrollment of 50 students and a tuition of $400 a year. In one of the brochures that's up here, you'll see what the current tuition is. I won't mention it. <laughs> a couple of you may know. And send children there. But things didn't continue well, and by 1872, the academy was forced to combine efforts and share facilities with the seminary. In 1889, Drill Hall burned down, and the school almost closed at that time. It only survived due to the efforts of a Mr. William B. Owen, who assumed charge of the school and assembled and tutored students in the facilities of the Baptist Theological Seminary. During this period, from 1890 to 1892, the school was often referred to as the Owen School, although there was never an official name change. Mr. Owen later became principal of the Chicago Normal School, which I believe then became the Chicago Teachers College and underwent another uh, Chicago State University, I guess it is now, isn't it? <laughs> Meanwhile, the seminary grew and prospered, and in 1885, Blake Hall, named in honor of a wealthy seminary benefactor and later supporter of the university, was built on 111th Street on the site presently occupied by the Beverly Arts Center. Once again, this is an attractive picture. Some of them are taken just for the beauty with the trees and so forth, as this one is. Uh, others, that I see one or two of them around, uh, perhaps show a little more detail. I remember when Blake Hall burned down and there was a tremendous loss uh, as an architectural landmark in, in the community. That building held, uh, that is Blake Hall, uh, included classrooms, a library, and a chapel. Students were attracted to the seminary because of the fine facility, the quality of the curriculum, and the competent faculty assembled, which included Dr. William Rainey Harper. Although in 1886, Harper was persuaded to return to Yale, where he quickly achieved a national reputation as a teacher, lecturer, and editor. Fortunately for Morgan Park Military Academy, a plan was being developed by John D. Rockefeller for the establishment of a new University of Chicago under the presidency of Dr. Uh, Harper. At first reluctant to leave Yale, Dr. Harper finally agreed to come, subject to a number of conditions he established for the university. He never expected Rockefeller to accept them. But among those stipulations were the requirement first that the Baptist Seminary be relocated to the university campus as its divinity school, and that the seminary buildings at Morgan Park be used for a university 
Academy. Under the authorization of the University Board of Trustees, Morgan Park Academy of the University of Chicago opened in the fall of 1892 as a coeducational, non-military institution, although it continued as both a boarding and day school. The first class included 99 young men and women. Morgan Hall served as a dormitory for the young women, and Blake Hall was used for recitation and assembly. Some of the outstanding educators who served as deans during this period included George Harmon, George Thurber, W.J. Chase, Isaacs Burgess, and Franklin Johnson. I'm going to read this because I think it's very interesting, but uh, because of the association or affiliation uh, between the university and uh, the, the uh, academy, the university automatically granted admission to students that graduated from the academy. It was on the basis of an annual uh, inspection or evaluation of the school. And this is from the University of Chicago certifying the Morgan Park Academy, having been examined and approved by delegates of the University of Chicago, has been admitted by the Board of University Relations to cooperation with the university. And it goes on to say that in accordance with this action, pupils who have been graduated from this school may, during the term of this certificate, be admitted to the University of Chicago upon certificate and without entrance examinations. And it goes on. Uh, given by order of the Board of University Relations of the University of Chicago this first day of December, 1908. I think that's a very interesting uh, part of the history of the Academy. Thank you, Sam. The actual campus at that time included both the original Academy land uh, plus land owned by the seminary. In 1894, however, Park Hall burned down. That's the one that was on the site of the gymnasium. And the university began construction of additional buildings. Uh, West Hall was built in 1897 at 112th Street near Bell, and East Hall was built in 1898 at 112th Street and Lothair. These two dormitory buildings were constructed of brick and brownstone at a combined cost of $90,000. If you look at the two buildings, they really look very much alike. Uh, the only way that you can tell the difference is that East Hall had columns in the front. Uh, with the ionic, the ionic ionic columns at the top. And this is East Hall, and West Hall had a, a plain arch uh, over the doorway, the uh, central doorway. But uh, both of these buildings, can you hear me okay with that? Both of these buildings were still uh, standing when I first came to the school, and I taught in the lower school, so this was where I had classes on the, in the basement and on the first floor, and then the dormitory rooms for the students, the younger students were on the second and third floor of this building. I believe West Hall for a time housed the Morgan Park Junior College, if I remember correctly, and the laboratories were up on the third floor, and the rest of the building uh, were classrooms. They refer to it frequently as having been a dormitory building, but I never saw how it could have been used as a dormitory building uh, in the time that, uh, that I was uh, around there. <coughs> Uh, apart from residential structures on the campus, the gymnasium today is the only building from this era still in use by Morgan Park Academy. <clears throat> this is an old picture of the gym, and unfortunately, as is the case if you collect photographs, you know, there's never any identification of people or dates, so it's very difficult to guess. But this is probably in the um, 20s, I would uh, guess, a, a number of cadets standing out in front of the gym. One of the interesting things, though, back at the time that the academy was part of the University of Chicago was that they were an athletic powerhouse. And uh, uh, Stagg and others, uh, uh, Abels and Jones themselves, both were very good athletes. And the emblems or letters, letter sweaters that the uh, cadets wore, uh, they weren't cadets at the time, the students wore, uh, had MPA on it, but the MPA was surrounded by a C uh, for the University of Chicago, and it was Morgan Park Academy of the University of Chicago. So when the uh, affiliation was, just, uh, was uh, dissolved, then instead of 
changing it entirely. They simply closed the sea so that it uh, became uh, this kind of an emblem. And again, I'll leave these up uh, here so that you can take, take a look at that as well. There are some wonderful old pictures of the athletes uh, from the turn of the century that are uh, literally funny to look at uh, for any number of reasons. During the years at the close of the century, two men joined the academy who were to have a profound and long-lasting effect on the school. Harry Delmont Abels joined the instructional staff in 1897, one year after his graduation from the University of Chicago. And then in 1899, also one year after his graduation, Dr. Hayden Evan Jones came to the school. And these two men set out immediately to implement the standards of excellence demanded by Dr. Harper. The large bowl area at the, at the academy is named Jones Bowl in honor not of me, but of uh, Dr. Hayden Jones, uh, of course. Declining female enrollment by 1900 brought about a change which restricted attendance to boys only. And in the early 1900s, attendance leveled off at slightly below 200. With the death of Dr. Harper in 1906, together with increasing need for financial subsidies by the university, the Board of Trustees of the university announced that it was closing University Academy at Morgan Park. During 1907 and 08, the property was leased to an Army captain, retired Army captain, George Byroad, who with Colonel Abels conducted the school for one year. The following year, Colonel Abels ran the school himself. Then, in conjunction with several other man, men, the school continued under private management and managed to survive with financial support from the community and through the dedicated efforts of Colonel a Colonels Abels and Jones. In December of 1914, a charter was granted by the state of Illinois for a board of trustees to conduct the Morgan Park Preparatory School as a not-for-pecuniary-profit educational institution. And under this charter, Abels was named as superintendent. A board of trustees was established, and it, it included such prominent men as J.C. Hansen, Paul Harper, Horace Horton, Robert Thompson, James Pitt, and Enoch Price. I'm sure that many of you historians recognize some of those names. Uh, arrangements were made for the purchase of the property on which the original school and earlier school were located, and, the, and for the purchase of five acres of land on the north side of 111th Street, where the seminary's Morgan Hall and the laboratory building had been located. I have one other, build, uh, one other picture, which is a very old picture, and I think it is of the property there uh, on the north side of 111th Street. Maybe one of the historians among us here could help me out afterward. Uh, in the background, though, I think is the picture of Morgan Hall. And this building, uh, which... Uh, uh, Today, I think, has moved across the street to the immediate north of the library on 111th Street there. Significantly modified, if you look at it, it now is uh, kind of a, a Spanish stucco style, and they've taken uh, the cupola off and, and made some other changes, but the basic construction is the same. I always thought that building was the laboratory building, but it's identified on the sign outside as having been the library. Uh, so. I don't know which is correct. It may have been had both usages uh, over a period of time. But I think you'll find it interesting to look at this because of what the building originally was. And I don't know of any other pictures of, of that original building and because of the uh, history of it and the other building in the background. Shortly, shortly after the close of World War I, under the impetus of the Alumni Association President, President Horace J. Mellon of the class of 1892, Alumni Hall construction was begun in 1926 as a memorial to those alumni who had died in the war. In 1927, plans were drawn for the construction of another building opposite Alumni Hall. This new dormitory building, originally called North Hall, was renamed Hanson Hall following the death in 1928 of Mr. J.C. Hanson, the Vice President of the Trustee Board. These buildings were constructed at a cost of $185,000 and $150,000, respectively. And they were designed by a member of the Military Academy class of 1904, uh, Ralph H. Oliver of the firm of Holmes and Finn here uh, in Chicago. I'm sure you uh, have seen many, many pictures of these. This is a picture of Hanson Hall shortly after its construction, and it shows the 
wooden walkway that uh, went across to the building on the opposite side. This is a, a picture of Alumni Hall, probably shortly after its construction at the time of uh, one of the ceremonies there. I think the graduation ceremony because it looks to me like uh, the graduates are lined up along the walkway uh, at, at the front of that building. Some of you may remember Alumni Hall in a slightly different way. Um, I remember how many times I have talked to uh, women in the community who have said, oh yeah, I used to go there for dances when I was in high school and afterward. And this is a picture of the football dance uh, that was held in Upper Alumni Hall in 1937. If any of you happen to go to that dance and want to look for yourself, uh, the picture will be up here. Incidentally, well, these are the ones I couldn't quite un uncover. But this is a picture of the tennis team from 1900. Uh, and it really is, is a, a classical picture, just to say the least. Very interesting. You'll uh, enjoy looking at it. And this is, this is a football team, and as close as I can figure it, it out, this also was about 1900, uh, showing once again, or um, it would be uh, a little later than that. This would be after the, no, this would be during the time when it was with the University of Chicago because it has a C uh, around the MPA. <laughs> Despite extreme financial difficulties during the Depression years, the Academy remained strong and before 1940 had an enrollment of 200 boarding students and 150 day students. During World War II, many Academy graduates entered the Army directly from high school, and many, many lost their lives in that war. One year, the Army actually had buses parked out on 111th Street to transport many of the seniors directly to the induction center immediately following the graduation exercises. At one time, the campus had numerous stately elm trees each dedicated to an alumnus who had given his life in the war. But the Dutch elm disease forced the removal of virtually every tree on campus in the mid-1960s. After the war, the academy continued its classification by the U.S. War Department as an essentially military school, and as such supported an infantry junior unit of the Reserve Officers Training Corps. Under the capable direction of Colonel Abels and Colonel Jones, the academy was recognized nationally, uh, repeatedly, as one of the leading military schools in the Midwest, if not the nation. And one of the highlights every year was the parade, I believe it was on Memorial Day, when the uh, Cadet Corps paraded down Michigan Boulevard. And this is just one of several pictures that we have at, of school of the uh, parade down Michigan Boulevard. Those of you that are more familiar with the downtown streets can probably identify exactly the exact location there. After 47 years of service, Colonel Abels retired in 1945. And I saw a news release about his retirement up on the wall here. Colonel Jones remained active until his death in July of 1946, as he sat at his desk preparing a transcript for a recent graduate. During the decade following, the school experienced a significant decline. Single-gender schools, boarding schools, and military schools were increasingly falling out of favor with the general public. Limited financial resources resulted in lowered faculty salaries, which in turn diminished somewhat the quality of newer faculty members. The deferring of maintenance and repairs became commonplace, and the older buildings on campus were allowed to deteriorate. There were indications that the quality of students enrolling in the school was likewise somewhat in decline. Plagued by declining enrollment, decreasing revenues, and a deteriorating physical plan, and prompted by concern for the future of the Academy, the Board of Trustees under its chairman, Mr. Arthur Horton, uh, associated with Chicago Bridge and Iron, decided upon a bold course of action. They were convinced that an independent school did have a place in this Southside community. They were also convinced, though, that it had to be a top-flight school with a high-quality curriculum, first-rate teachers and competent students, all working toward a single objective, to provide the finest possible college edu uh, preparatory education uh, for the students that were enrolled. And in the face of an awful lot of opposition at the time, the trustees determined to let nothing stand in the way of achieving this goal. Therefore, the very controversial decision was made at the close of the 1957-58 school year to change the character of the school from a boys military and boarding school to a non-military co-educational day school and to expand the program of the lower school to include grades beginning with the pre-first grade. In 1958, 
The school once again became Morgan Park Academy. Mr. Frederick B. Whittington became the headmaster, and serious efforts were made to reestablish the school as a community day school, offering a strong college preparatory program to qualify boys and girls from the west side of Chicago, south west side of Chicago. Regrettably, what we now refer to as the public relations aspect of that decision and the change could not possibly have been handled more poorly. Student, parent, alumni, and even community response was immediate, intense, and highly unfavorable. Many parents withdrew, withdrew their children and sent them to other military uh, academies. <clears throat> Most of the alumni began immediately to withhold voluntary financial support and resistance to the change went so far as to include verbal threats and attempts at intimidation of the newly appointed head. And it has long been suspected that when Blake Hall, which was unused at the time, burned down in 1962, it very likely was a case of arson. Perhaps understandably, the new school administration responded defensively and literally sought to erase much of the long tradition of the military institution. <clears throat> I remember uh, shortly after the change going around with the superintendent of buildings and grounds and hiding a lot of pictures, a lot of these pictures and other records so that they wouldn't be destroyed uh, at that time. At the beginning of the 1965-66 school year, Headmaster Withington announced his resignation. And after a brief search process, I was named to be the new headmaster effective July 1st of 1966. Um, the announcement in 1958 that the school was about to change came as a great surprise to me but I remained following demilitarization and under Ted Withington held a variety of administrative uh, positions. In my first year as head, uh, in 1966, our, we opened school with an enrollment of 375 students, and this year the school has had an enrollment of 460 students. During my tenure as headmaster, I've been uh, privileged to witness numerous changes at the school. One of the first and most significant changes was the board's decision and this is a quotation, to reaffirm the responsibility of the headmaster in all decisions pertaining to the admission, retention, and dismissal of students. This was the circumlocution I provided to permit the racial integration of the school without making it necessary for the individual trustees, most of whom opposed integration at the time, to vote in favor of such action. A second significant change came about with the departure of the final boarding students in 1968. Some of you here may remember the, 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 those days in the late 60s and, and the fuss about integration of the academy at the time. <laughs> Shortly after I became headmaster, I was privileged to engage in conversations with Arthur and Alice Baer and Ele Eleanor Pillsbury regarding the possibility of constructing an art center on the campus of Morgan Park Academy. After considerable discussion and negotiation, the Academy and Board agreed to begin a two-year joint fundraising effort uh, to underwrite the construction of two new buildings, a classroom building for the lower school, uh, for the Academy lower school, to be followed immediately by an art center building. And with funds primarily from the Barker family and many others, Barker Hall on the campus was completed and opened its doors for classes in September of 1968. Beverly Arts Center marked its opening in the fall of 1969. In the years that followed, other significant changes took place in the physical plant. South Field, the area immediately south of the gymnasium, was, it, uh, was improved as a football field and then as a soccer field after football was discontinued about 1979. The southeast corner of the physical education property was developed as a softball field and four tennis courts were built on the southwest corner. The gymnasium itself underwent significant uh, renovation, repair, and remodeling, uh, as did both Alumni Hall and Hanson Hall. Most recently, the second floor facilities in Alumni Hall were modified to house a very modern multimedia computer center. And an important effort over the past few years has been the maintenance and beautification of the park-like campus grounds uh, of the school. And I'm happy to report that over 70 trees now have replaced the elm trees lost in earlier years years and uh, because I was able to plant uh, or help in the planting of most of those it's a delight now to see them so uh, so large and, and fully grown at this time. <clears throat> the quality of the academy and the prestige which it currently enjoys uh, within the national independent school community give ample testimony I think to the wisdom of the decision made by the trustees 39 years ago. 
You're probably aware that I announced last fall my retirement from the school at the close at the end of July of this year, ending my tenure of 40 years with the academy, 31 years as its head. A new headmaster, Mr. J. William Adams, has already been appointed. Without a doubt, the academy will continue to undergo numerous changes under his leadership in the years ahead. But I am confident that despite any changes which may take place, the academy will remain true to the standards of excellence which mark its inception and which have been adhered to throughout the tenures of Dr. Harper, Colonel Abels, Mr. Whittington, and myself. Thank you very much. I have just one other picture quickly to show you. This is a picture of, uh, I forgot to mention it, but the field across uh, 111th Street where the, uh, the townhouses or condominiums stand now, uh, Abels Field, uh, was located. This is an old picture of it. And those of you that may have known Captain Gray, who taught at the academy for many, many years, uh, he lived in the house that was off at the one end of, uh, of Southfield. That's it. I don't know that I can answer uh, any questions, but I'd be happy to give, give it a try if any of you would like. And you're, happy, you're welcome to come and take a look at these pictures uh, after we're dismissed. Thank you very much. come from inside the city and 50% of them come from outside outside of the city including about 30 students or so each year that come from northern Indiana uh, areas of the 50% from Chicago about half come from the greater Morgan Park area and they represent a tremendous diversity um, each year within just a fraction of a percentage point our black enrollment stands at about 25% and that has not changed for 20 years. Um, in addition to that, we have another 25% enrollment, uh, which I refer to as non-black minority, and it includes uh, Hispanic, Asian, Indian, uh, all, all different kinds of, uh, of, of people within the student body. And then the other 50% of the student body is what is generally classified as white, uh, although the mixture of uh, ethnic <laughs> representation there is also something that's fantastic. Uh, it's a very beautiful thing, I think, to see uh, the children throughout the, all of the grades, starting at the lowest grades, going on up into the higher grades, uh, associating so freely and openly with, uh, with other children of uh, significantly different backgrounds. Um, we took a quick survey last year and uh, just asked, or we began, just two years ago it was, uh, began asking on the application, is any language other than English spoken in the home? And if yes, identify it. And you wouldn't believe the number of languages, languages that I had never heard of. I think we counted up just within the, the students admitted within the, those next two years, something like 37 different languages being spoken uh, in, 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 in the homes. Um, so it's a very wonderful thing. <coughs> until it comes time to read the names of graduation diplomas. <laughs> this year's valedictorian is a little girl, beautiful little girl from Thailand. Her name, uh, give me a minute here. Hemelak Rosalind Suatanapangchet. <laughs> that, uh, that doesn't fit easily on any kind of plaque, believe me. Uh, but we enjoy the diversity. But Sue, you remember those uh, days in the late 60s uh, uh, and, and the pure it's caused advertising from the paper and so forth. Uh, Sir, well. Joan? Did you happen to know Bob White's uh, mother, whom I understand was the secretary there for many years? Was, was her Bob? name White as well? I believe so. I don't uh, know. The oldest of the uh, clerical staff that I knew was Marie Dwyer, who mm -hmm. uh, was there, my goodness, 40 years, uh, I suppose, mm -hmm. at least. And year after year after year uh, attended commencement until she I think she may have had to miss the 40th commencement because of her illness, and I thought, I'll never attend that many. Well, this will be my 40th. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it just shows my age. What percentage of your graduates go on to college? Uh, I don't know. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I think it's about 
universities do they tend to go? Okay. Uh, we always use the word virtually, virtually 100%. What it means is that every now and then a student waits a year or a student goes into the Army uh, for a time first. But uh, in general, every student goes on to college uh, in the fall following graduation. Where do they go? All over the place. Um, I have noticed, for example, with the large uh, uh, Indian and Asian populations, they don't want their children to go too far from home. So uh, University of Chicago and Northwestern are very popular with those particular students uh, because of the cost factor, I think, involved uh, in, in going to college as well as the, because of the quality of the school. The University of Illinois is very popular, but you may not be aware of the fact that it's, it's more selective in its admissions than many, many of the Eastern Ivy League colleges. Uh, and it's not based on character and activities and all. You have to have high scores and good grades. Uh, so it's a very difficult school to be uh, admitted to. But beyond that, it's, it's all over the place. I think the little girl that I mentioned, the valedictorian, is going to uh, uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, MIT. And we generally have students going to uh, at least one or two of the Ivy League schools, usually one or two at Stanford. Um, but they just go all over the place. One, one girl uh, from the, lives in the community, a wonderful gymnast, turned down a full tuition athletic scholarship in gymnastics to Stanford to go to Louisiana State University uh, because they have a better gymnastics coach at LSU than they do at Stanford. However, she was admitted to the brilliant girl, salutatorian of this year's class. She was uh, admitted to the Honors College there. I'm sure she'll have a fine education. They go all over the place. Yes? Um, there's bus service for the students, isn't there? Yes. Yeah. We operate a fleet of about 12 or 13 buses mm -hmm. and uh, a radius of 20 or 25 miles. We go out to Portland, Indiana, near Hyde Park, and Hickory Hills, for a ridge sometimes, Oak Brook. I was going to ask you, one of those last pictures, was that one of the marching fields where on Sunday afternoon they'd all be in their military uniform and everybody yeah. in the neighborhood uh, would turn out and watch the march? Because I had a couple of friends that were marching in those days. Yes, and they, the parades, uh, they would form up on the main campus mm -hmm. and then they would march, stop the traffic, and there wasn't much on 111th Street at that time. <laughs> but they would stop the traffic and then march across the street and have the drill for the parade pass and review over on... Uh, uh, in Abel's Field, as it was called, across the street. That would be the field, yes. Do you remember the trolleys that ran on uh, 11th Street? Kind of came up Vincennes Avenue, swaying around the corner, and then up there, and uh, up Monterey, and, and it ended at uh, Western Avenue. Wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. Mr. Jones, could you speak about the, the conviction, the guidance, the counsel that, that entered into your very courageous decision to that was a very tough time for that kind of decision. Well, I've, I've never been a crusader, to say the least. And, uh, and yet, I think that the idea that all men were created equal has always meant an awful lot to me. I remember back in 1946, while I was still in high school, I entered a competition. It was an essay competition sponsored by the Hull House down in London. You know where it is, and uh, took first prize. And the essay that I wrote had to do with the idea of, of uh, the, the need for integration, of, for people to get along in a, in a different way than had been practiced in the past. Um, my predecessor, Ted Withington, was uh, committed to that, and much more as a crusader, uh, and found tremendous resistance at, at the academy, uh, in the community, and all the rest to the idea. And I've often thought that one of the reasons that he left the school uh, was because they refused to uh, permit the integration of the academy. The trustees, and I'm sure that they were convinced that they were right, felt that it was not the right thing to do. And none of them wanted individually to, uh, for it to be said about them that it's your fault that it integrated. So I thought if it's ever going to be done, the only way would be to blame it on me. And uh, unfortunately, according to the bylaws, it, one of the job descriptions of the headmaster is that the headmaster is responsible for the admission, retention, and dismissal of students. And so we simply asked the board to vote uh, reaffirming the statement in the bylaws that the headmaster is responsible for that. And at that meeting, which lasted, I think, three hours, and every trustee spoke going around the table two or three times, um, uh, 
that when they finally came to a vote, and there were, I think, 22 present, 21 of them voted in favor of the resolution and one abstained. And, uh, and, and it was as easy as that. And uh, we, had, we began with students in the lower grades, you know, pre first, first, second grade at the, at the time, and uh, it was just an easy integration. One of the one of the girls, uh, I don't even think I told my wife, Jackie Jones. Did you see Jackie Jones the other night? Uh, one of the very first girls that we uh, ever admitted to the school. Wonderful girl, black girl, holding a job downtown, and married. Uh, does that really answer your question? Yes, and I have to tell you that when I met Mr. Adams, the first thing I said to him was that I so much appreciated the racial diversity of Mormon Park Academy. So I. I'm, I'm sure he does. I'm sure he does. Most of our independent school educators now nowadays pretty much take it for granted. Um, and our students would insist on it. They speak of it as, as uh, being one of the greatest, best characteristics of the school. They learn to get along with other people. How important that is today. Um, that one of the students that was at an assembly that they held to honor myself and Mrs. Theodore, who's also retiring, one of the students read a poem. And it was kind of an admonition to the student body, recognize what you have here in this diversity and enjoy it, because you won't always see it, and how true it is. Uh, David, I think this group should know also that the Morgan Park Key Club is one of the top clubs in America on raising money and doing various projects. They stand way above the average group. And also, uh, your alumni like uh, Chandler Winkless, or Chuck Hilliard, Dr. Hilliard, and Bill Counts, who's a former president of our uh, uh, Kiwanis Club, Southwest, are all graduates of uh, your academy. And of course, once we lost Martin Wolf, Martin Wolf was uh, king of everybody. I guess one of the sad things about growing older is that you remember the people that you used to. He used to be around. Martin certainly has been Thank you, Mr. Kowalis, uh, uh, for that. It, it is true. I think for a while there are something like 80 percent of our student body uh, in the high school belong to the Kowalis Key Club as the major service orientation of the school. And, um, they went to uh, Washington James Smith uh, home and had dances there. Henry Kennedy who was on the board, not a not a uh, an alumnus, but was on the board of the academy for a time. That, around wonderful people. Uh, wasn't Russ Beatty the chairman of the Board of Trustees at the time of the um, decision to go co-ed? Uh, he was not the chair. Uh, Arthur Horton was the chairman of the board at that well, time. You, you said the PR was so bad. The reason I'm asking is that I escaped that cornering that problem because I had cases of measles. <laughs> and I gave the job to my former partner, Mary Taylor Parkinson who then took over this thorny problem of making the community like the decision. And I assume that she did rather a good job. Well, you know what, I, I didn't mean to imply that the people here had done a, uh, that poor a job. The whole result of it was poor. But some of the people that came in, the faculty that came in, and a lot of them were brought in from schools in the East, uh, they said things, oh, we're going to clean up this place, and we need a new room to sweep out all these dunderheads, and that kind of stuff. That, you know, that just wasn't true. That kind of feeling, and there was strong resistance, and there was uh, there were statements made that uh, no school can be a good school if it's a military academy. Well, that isn't true either. I don't think uh, under the circumstances it would have been difficult for that particular school to, to, to be good and to be a military school. That's very true. But you know there are other crimes on your West Point and Dallas. Uh, yeah. uh, when someone had asked about busing, uh, you know having buses. Uh, bring the students from far and wide. And I remember one time asking Dave, well, what is the furthest uh, commute anyone had? He said, well, one year, we had a girl from Boston. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently her folks had business both in Boston and in Chicago and would be back and forth. So she would go a couple days to school in, at Morton Park Academy and then go to an almost comparable school <laughs> in Boston uh, on, a, you know, on the same level. And I always thought that was uh, amusing. <laughs> that was just a we have uh, two Dorn students.
this year, both from France yeah. this year, but we oftentimes have foreign students from Spain or from Mexico or South America someplace. Mm -hmm. Another great experience for the students. I don't want to just prolong this. Uh, I'm sure some of you may want to go, but did you know, one of the things that said was that you couldn't have to leave the home at any time. There's a paper background, and that's why we're going to do away with the military school. And it was all over the neighborhood, you know, about kids. My friends, well, a friend of my family, who was on the board at that time, and he said, This is such nonsense. And he said, The reason for demilitarizing the school was. The board felt that too much time was spent on military exercises and that they, to uh, upgrade the scholastic standard of the school, they had to eliminate it. Was that true? Yeah. I think the whole thing is true. <clears throat> Ted Withington did come from a Quaker yeah. background, yes. His parents were missionaries uh, uh, in Hawaii, I think it was. Um, but Ted himself, uh, served in the Second World War as an Air Force bomb, bomber pilot and was shot down, I think, twice. Uh, and he, he was written a book about it twice from the or something like that. And uh, so he was not opposed to the concept of war and military. I mean, everybody's opposed to war, but I, not from that, uh, not, not from the passive uh, viewpoint. Uh, so it certainly wasn't because he was a crazy. What is true is that uh, during the uh, military days, the students, the cadets, spend an hour a day studying uh, military science and tactics, as they call it. Use the microphone. I'm sorry? Use the microphone. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Uh, the students were spending an hour a day studying uh, military science in, in, their, in, the class, in the classroom. They had a whole staff of military instructors. Uh, in addition, they were spending a lot of time outside of school hours, shining their buttons and shining their shoes, and it took an awful lot of time to, to, be, uh, to pass those inspections that were held every morning. And then a lot of the activities centered around semi-military kinds of things, the grenadiers, uh, the parade kinds of things, parade practices, the rifle team, and um, it was an important military, a part of military life, but it was starting to take away from the academic focus. Uh, nowadays, with all the additional things that we have to teach, that we didn't have to teach when I was in school, it didn't have to be taught when back when I was in school, I don't know how you'd ever have time for it. And uh, a school like Culver, uh, for example, we all think of as a military academy, has is semi-military, I think, would be a reasonably fair word to use. It's interesting that you mentioned about polishing the, the brass and all. Uh, if you'll notice on the stair landing, there's a mannequin with a uh, Morgan Park Military Academy uniform on. When I put the uniform on that mannequin, the brass buttons were pretty dull looking, and I thought, oh dear, but I've run out of time to polish them. <laughs> <laughs> so they Never wouldn't pass inspection. <laughs> I remember punishing students back in those early days because their hair touched their ear, over their ear. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Times have changed. <laughs> well, thank you very much. I really appreciate that. In the dining room, there are a few.